Hello, everyone. Thanks for um, being patient with us as we work through a few little tech issues. Um, my name is Claire, and I am your host today from Fairy God Boss. And I am very excited to host a very interesting conversation called You're Muted, How to Make Your Voice Heard Both Online and off. And today I have the pleasure of speaking of three women from Johnson and Johnson on speaking and leading with confidence. So Johnson and Johnson has been championing women and giving them the tools, resources, and opportunities to exceed at work and home since their founding more than 130 years ago, when eight of the first 14 women employees were women. Furthering that commitment, in 2015, J&J &J launched the We STEM 2D initiative. We STEM 2D stands for Women in Science, Technology, Engineering, Math, Manufacturing, and Design. The initiative supports and inspires girls and women in their pursuit of STEM 2D studies and careers, no matter where they are located globally. So let's get started. Sylvia, would you like to start us off by telling us your name, your title, and what you do at Johnson & Johnson? Um, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Sylvia Fui, and um, I lead the um, MD Deliver function and digital transformation for supply chain. So my job is to look and ensure we have the right deliver strategy globally for our medical devices business. And also we're leading the uh, digital of the supply chain, right, across all of the functions. Um, I've been 30 years with J&J. &J. Um, I'm Irish by, um, my nationality is Irish. I've been, worked in many, all three segments in a lot of regions, and I'm currently coming from you from Princeton, New Jersey. Excellent, thank you so much. Tara, would you like to go next for us? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Ramsey. It's, uh, it's so good to be here and uh, really good to see, to see Sylvia and Allison as well. This is an exciting panel. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I recently just moved into a new role within J&J &J, uh, in procurement. Um, I'm part of the, the procurement team. Um, so I right now I'm leading our uh, global IT category with responsibility for our infrastructure and our AZM categories. So essentially, um, our, our team, we fall within the business services space within all of uh, enterprise J&J &J procurement, um, which means we have responsibility for uh, working very, very closely with our IT stakeholders, partnering, partnering directly with JJT on um, all of their, their purchases, um, helping them, you know, really engage in new technologies, partnering with new suppliers, and, uh, you know, really um, spending wisely and investing smartly uh, within the JJT space. I've been with J&J &J for, uh, it'll be 19 years this summer. Uh, I've split my career between uh, primarily the procurement space and I've spent a lot of time in Deliver. Um, I have been in our consumer and our med device businesses, spending a good portion of my career with um, the Vision franchise, uh, the makers of AccuV contact lenses. Thank you so much. And Christine, love to hear from you. Or excuse me, Allison. Allison, I'd like to hear from you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Allison Scholes. I've been with Johnson & Johnson. It'll actually be four years next week. Um, before that, I spent the first seven years of my career at a large cosmetics company, also working in supply chain. My role right now is senior, management, senior manager of North America Deliver Business Development. So the deliver end of the supply chain really represents customer service, distribution and transportation, really the customer facing end of our supply chain. Um, and in my role right now, I'm in strategic project management. And I am fortunate enough to lead the North America distribution end of the project for our COVID-19 vaccine launch. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, along with uh, Tara and Sylvia. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I actually wanna get started with you if I could. Um, what was it like when you first started working? Were you, were you ever the only woman in the room and, and what did that feel like? Sure, um, well, I was, I was fortunate to be, again, starting my career in a cosmetics company in the beauty industry. It was actually more, more disproportionately female um, than male, even though the industry was more male dominated. Um, so I had worked in manufacturing actually as one of my roles, um, at a previous company. And there is really where I felt, um, that feeling of being the only female in the room and not just from a, a gender perspective, 
but also from an age perspective, I, I there was often found myself as one of the youngest ones in the room. And then now working on the COVID-19 vaccine launch in the pharmaceutical sector, definitely more of that presence of male, uh, more tenured um, and experienced um, population in the room. And that, that has definitely contributed to some imposter syndrome for me along the way, um, which we can get into a little bit more. Yeah, great. Love to talk to, talk about that a little bit more um, a little bit later. Tara, how about for you? Same, same question. Um, when you first started out, were you, did you have the experience of being the only woman in the room? I think we, we might be losing her a little bit. All right. So nope. we'll head to Sylvia. No, I'm here. Oh, excellent. You, you walked away. So Sorry. we'll come back to you in just a you moment. Know, Good. Oh, I'm there kidding. she is. <laughs> you know what I was doing? I was actually turning off the baby monitor. So uh, as we're talking about, as so we're talking kind of, about um, kind of, women, yeah. women and the challenges that we always have, um, my my eight month old is waking up. So I was just turning on the baby, turning off the baby monitor. So you guys weren't hearing him as well. Um, so so to answer the question, initially no. Uh, the area that I started within J and J, no, I was I was definitely not the first female I started in commercial procurement. It wasn't until I moved into supply chain um, where I really started to feel maybe like the odd woman out. And, and it's interesting because in procurement, we have a very externally facing role. I spend a good portion of my time partnering and working with, um, with others outside of Johnson & Johnson. Um, and so when I was re, you know, thinking about this question, um, I actually feel like in that capacity as well, I am often um, the only female. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting dynamic because I partner so closely with people outside of J&J &J that, you know, it, it didn't necessarily dawn on me when I was younger in my career. I didn't notice it. Um, moving into the supply chain, I started to see it more and more often. And now being so externally focused and, um, you know, spending a good portion of my career focused in supply chain and, and buying raw materials, packaging, external manufacturing, partnering, um, you know, really in the supply chain space, I am very often the only female, um, both in, in, you know, have been the only female, both on the supplier side, as well as in the J&J &J side. So I definitely have experienced it. Gotcha. So what, um, what did that feel like to be the only, the only woman in the room? How did that affect what you, you think in terms of your natural style of speaking up and getting your ideas heard? Yeah, similar to Allison, I always thought I was uh, one of the younger people in the room, especially earlier in my career, not so much anymore. Um, but, you know, in the beginning, I probably think it was just a confidence issue and it was something that I was acutely aware of. Um, but but it's interesting over the past few years, I feel like, you know, as I kind of hit my like mid to late 30s and, you know, your your confidence just builds and you look around a company like J&J &J and you see so many incredible, powerful female leaders, two of which we have on the phone right now. Right. And and not only at this level, but I mean, you look at Kathy Wangle all the way down and there's so many incredible women leading an organ and and you know, in charge of this organization that I think that that just kind of resonates with you and, and you you become more empowered and you feel, um, you know, you, you kind of say, well, if, if they can do it, then I can certainly do it as well, right? And they're here for a reason, um, so I'm here for a reason. Um, but again, I think that's something that as I've just gotten older and a little bit wiser, um, that that has come to fruition. Um, younger in my career, it, you know, I, I probably was, you know, feelings of a bit intimidated or um, a bit shy or a bit nervous. Um, so, but I think, you know, that's just one of the beauties of, of aging, I suppose. <laughs> Great. Um, Sylvia, how about for you? I imagine your experience, uh, or I should ask you, I shouldn't assume anything for you. Was your experience different coming from, a, you know, you've worked internationally in terms of being the only woman in the room and what that was like when you first started? And uh, no, it's very, very similar. I think, you know, just for me, um, when I was in college, there was very few, when I did finance degree, right? And again, the number of females in finance were, were quite small. And then when I got to, to work in J&J, &J, I remember being a part of the Depew Synthes um, franchise. And, and for folks that know Depew Synthes, it's, you know, the surgeon, it's historically a very male dominated environment, right? Um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but the customer base, like the surgeons is, is historically very male dominated. It's changing now, but 20 years ago, that was the way it was. And I can remember being the, oh, I was the diversity statistic in supply chain. This might 
fame to fame, right? I was the only female director in supply chain in uh, Depew Synthes. Um, and I remember I had the most beautiful boss um, and he, he used to be terrified of me, right? He used to be afraid that I was like, are you gonna break on me or something? And I used to be going, Ed, you know, you gotta treat me the same, please, right? You know, you have to be giving me feedback. You have to be, um, you know, challenging me. And it was just a really interesting dynamic, right? And, you know, when you're in meetings, it was all about, you know, the rugby, the Red Sox, all of that stuff. And I didn't know how to behave. And there was, you know, it took me a long time to really figure out how I should behave in a, in, um, in an environment like that when I'm when I am the only female. But eventually I got to a point where it was a, just you just gotta be yourself, you know, you, you just gotta be yourself, right? It was I have no interest in baseball or rugby or sports, right? And I'm I wasn't gonna fake it because well, I don't, right? So it was learning to be yourself. And that's coming into learning. I think Tara, Tara mentioned it, learning to trust yourself learning to trust what you bring to the party, trust your intellect, trust the value that you bring, okay? And it's hard when you're trailblazing or being the first, but learning to trust yourself really, really makes a difference in these types of situations. Okay. Now, Alison had mentioned a little bit earlier, and I'd love to get back to you about this, Alison, about imposter syndrome, and, and particularly being in supply chain, which, as you'd mentioned, overwhelmingly male. Was that um, something that you you dealt with um, in terms of in terms of being a woman in that? You had mentioned, you know, finding yourself. But in the beginning, were you were you dealing with kind of imposter syndrome, and did you have any strategies around that? Sylvia, sorry. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, I thought you were going to say Alison. No, okay. I'm sorry. So um, I was at a um, I was at a talk. I had just the most amazing privilege last year, pre-COVID. I heard Michelle Obama speak. And she, it was in a live forum, and she said that she suffers from imposter syndrome, right? And she has suffered from imposter syndrome. And that bit of an aha came off, came, went off in my head, right? If she's got imposter syndrome, right? Well, what does it mean for the rest of us? Um, for me, um, felt I think always when, well, for instance, when you start a new job, do you feel that way, right? I mean, are we programmed that we feel that? Can we do it? Is it a stretch too much? Have I proven it? And you come from a, a perspective where you feel, unless I'm perfect at this job, it means I'm not succeeding in this job, as opposed to, look, I'm growing into this job. I am learning every day. I am getting better and better at what I do. So, yes. The answer to yes is imposter, but you gotta get, you gotta go in your head. Thank you, but I got it right. I've got this role, and um, I'm learning, and I'm doing good. So it's it's learning to befriend that voice in your head that says talks imposter. You're going, yeah, I hear you, but no, thank you. I know exactly what I'm doing here, and I will, and and I can achieve this. Okay. Great, love that. And, and Alison, you had mentioned imposter syndrome. You're the first one to bring it up. Can you talk to me a little bit about what your experience with that was like in your career, if, if you still kind of struggle with that and, and how you really have been working on that challenge? Sure, I, I think Sylvia hit it really well. Um, every time probably I reach a new challenge, it, it sneaks back up a bit uh, more. So I don't know that it ever fully goes away, but to Sylvia's point, maybe I'm more equipped to to listen to that voice, but not take that voice as as the guiding force. Um, another way that I, I tackle that is, is I tire kind of hit on this. I build my confidence through knowledge. Um, so new space, especially asking a lot of questions, trying to kind of bring myself up to speed behind the scenes where possible and really networking one on one with people and building those relationships. So I get a lot of confidence through the network that I that I have around me. Um, I particularly um, enjoy building those relationships more in a one-on-one -on -one, um, environment than in a large room. I'm, I'm an introvert as well. So that's kind of two cards stuffed against, uh, against that progress. But um, yeah, I, I, it's more of awareness. And I think the other element for me is, is leaning into the mental health and well-being too. Um, I, I have a relationship with a therapist. I highly recommend it for everyone. Um, and I think through that is where I can really have a safe space to talk through those ideas and that voice in my head and really tease through how much of that voice is more of a, a slight warning and how much of that is just something to Sylvia's point, the voice that says, I've got this and uh, you know, you can just, can just park on the side there. 
Great. Now, um, Tara, same same question for you around imposter syndrome. And then we have a question from the from the audience around that that I'd love to get all of your answers on. So yes, every single time I start a new job, which uh, so over the past two months, starting a new role, new competency, new language, new everything you could possibly think of. I feel like a complete imposter um, in pretty much 99% of the meetings that, I, that I'm joining. Um, so um, I have a, I think I have quite a few people actually from my team or maybe even my boss actually on this call. So, um, you know, just to be rest assured, um, I will get there. I will get it. Um, I have all the confidence that I can do this. And honestly, you know, J and J, right. They, they empower us. They give these positions. They, they would not have asked me to do this role. I would not have been offered to do this role if they didn't believe me. Right. And that's ultimately what I kind of kept, keep reminding myself and what I'm lucky enough that I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of people that believe in me. I have, I have advocates, I have mentors and I have coaches that, you know, keep telling me that you, you can do this. Right. And exactly what Allison said, knowledge, knowledge is power, right? When I start a new job, I have zero idea about IT. Uh, let's be perfectly frank, right? I really, I don't know much about the space. I'm surprising myself how much I'm learning and it's fascinating, but, um, but I really did not know much about this space, but knowledge is power. And there's so much knowledge at our fingertips, right? The different uh, subscriptions that J&J belongs to, the different ways that I can ask my team questions and ask our suppliers questions. I mean, there's just a fountain of knowledge that, that, I, can, that I can go after, but you have, to, you have to ask for it, you have to be proactive for it, and you have to take the time to educate yourself. And that really helps to lessen the feeling of being an imposter. But, you know, in J&J, we switch roles typically every three to four years. So pretty much on a regular cadence, um, I'm feeling like an imposter. Um, but, but it's, it's, you know, it's manageable. It's, um, you know, it, it's within your space to help, um, you know, to help manage and, and it, it goes away, it gets better uh, and it gets really good. And then it's time to switch into a new position half the time anyways. Love that. So we have a question um, from the audience and um, I, that the, the question is, is imposter syndrome real or is it just part of learning the job? And the, the feeling is, do men really ignore women in the room or we, is it that we're just too shy to speak up? Tara, do you have any thoughts on that? So I don't say, I don't think I'm ignored, right? I think I have a, whether I know what I'm talking about or, or not, I have a pretty confident um, powerful voice that, that I use when I have to. Um, so I don't feel like I'm being ignored, but I, I like the, the shyness and the confidence piece, right? I am, especially when in a new space or something that I'm not 100% confident in, um, I may be a little bit, you know, quiet initially. I may, um, you know, I may be listening more than answering, which, which is okay. That's a good thing. Um, so again, I don't, I don't feel like I'm being ignored, um, but I, I do think it's, it's a confidence issue and it's, you know, I don't want to be answering questions that I don't necessarily have the answer to. Um, I can figure it out. Right. But so, so for me and, 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 you know, in my space that I'm in, I don't think that I'm, I'm being ignored right now. Okay. Um, Sylvia, for you, do you, do you feel that imposter syndrome is real or is it just a kind of a, an out, a function of being new in a role? And, and do you feel like you've been ignored by male colleagues? Um, so I think the, I think that question about imposter syndrome is really, um, it's really interesting. I think, fun, I mean, the, for me, there was a paradigm shift in my thinking where we assume, or I assumed all my thoughts were real, that if I thought it, it meant that it had to be right. I, no, 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 no. Just because you think about it and that's, and, and learning to go, okay, that's an interesting thought there. Help me understand talking to myself, right? Is it really true? Give me the evidence that it's true. And if it is true, then what are we going to do about it? So the voice, and I, I think psychologists or psychiatrists would have a whole different thing on this one, but, you know, learning what's driving the voice, I think is super important, right? And I think it's the newness, right? That you're not confident and then, then you do that, right? So it's learning to go, yeah, I hear you. I am new, but I got this, right? I got it, right? Um, and to be able to do that. I agree with the, um, the, the, the question here about, you know, men being 65%, right? They go in and jump in and then they'll, they'll do it. Women are different, right? And we're wired differently. We do need a feel that we've got to know it all to be successful. So again, just understanding that and being patient and kind to yourself 
knowing that that's how you're going to behave getting into a new job. Okay. Yeah. And, and for those uh, interested who maybe aren't looking at the chat, someone had chatted or someone had left the comment about the percentages of um, men who apply for a job versus women. Um, and again, this is, there's varying statistics, but generally men are more likely to apply for a job, even if they don't have all the qualifications versus women. So that, that I, I find fascinating. And, and Allison, how about for you? You had first mentioned imposter syndrome. So is it real or is it really about learning the job and how does that affect you and your ability to speak up? Yeah, I would agree with what Tara and Sylvia said and, and really put a bow on it by saying, I think imposter syndrome is an internal facing element, not really external or environment. So I don't see the a direct connection between being feeling ignored by men. And I, I also agree with Tara, I've, I've never felt that way. It's more about uh, limiting my own confidence to either go for a new opportunity or to speak up um, in a room of, of where I feel that maybe others have more experience or more knowledge. So it's definitely more personal for me than it is about um, the landscape. So, uh, Sylvia, for you, since the pandemic has started, you know, over a year now, uh, most of us or a lot of us have switched to at least part-time remote work. Have you noticed changes in, you know, speaking up when almost all of our interactions are like this? They are not in person in a meeting room or, you know, somewhere else. So have you noticed differences about it, between, with that? Um, or no, not, not really, right? I mean, I think with Zoom, I think it's, you know, we're seeing each, each other, being on, making sure you're on camera, right? And your microphone's on and you're actively engaged in the conversation. I think these, they're the fundamentals that you need, okay? Um, I think the, the wider issue, and it's been alluded to is, you know, are you being, are you, do you feel you're being heard? And I, I think that's on us, right? It's on me just to make sure that, you know, when you say something at a meeting, make sure you're saying something that's adding to the conversation, right? We're all being at meetings where people are just talking and not a lot of sense, well, not a lot of sense, but not a lot of substance, right? So, you know, it's learning to build your intellectual capital so that when you say Tara says something or Alison or somebody says something that it's worth listening to, okay? So I would always focus on, you know, um, what am I saying? Am I bringing value to the conversation? Am I really, you know, building by accretion, right? That I'm either challenging the point or I'm adding to the point, right? And it's the quality of what you say is so much to me more important than just talking up, okay? And it's learning to understand that. And I, and I call it building your intellectual capital, learning learning to ask the killer question. You know, you're looking at a diagram or a document and you go, okay, what's wrong with this? What, 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 what am I seeing? What are other people not seeing? And really beginning to become the person that they want at meetings, right? And that you're wanted at meetings as opposed to just saying something for the sake of saying it, okay? Right. So no, learning no. to ask the killer question, learning to ask the right question, right? Or make the right contribution is way more important than just talking, okay? Mm -hmm. And Tara, how about for you? And I believe you were in a newer position. So were you in the position before we went remote or did you go remote at all? So, so yes, I just started a new role, but prior to that, um, and actually for the past 13 months, I've been fully, fully remote. So my last role, um, which, which I was in hundred percent remote as well. So, and I agree. 150% with what Sylvia said. It's what is the quality of your input versus what is the quantity. It is an absolute pet peeve of mine, and I'm sure this resonates with so many people. We all know them, right? The individuals that are just constantly, and whether you're remote or you're in person, it's the same, it's the same people and it's the same style, right? Just speaking to be heard. I feel like there's like a mental checklist that people have that did I speak in this meeting? Did I speak in this, speak in this meeting? And, um, you know, people just feel the need to, to, um, to, to make mention of something, right? Whether it makes sense or not, whether it's on point or not, I, you know, I, I really question sometimes. So it's absolutely the, the quality. I love what Sylvia said, the, um, the you know, asking that, that question, building your intellectual capital. And I would say, too, some, some tips that I've even taken um, is if it's your think, thinking about being as well organized as, and as prepared for, for this whole new virtual space as um, that, that we can be, right? So whether when it's my meeting, 
um, sending an agenda ahead of time, right? Sending a pre pre read ahead of time. And now I know not everybody loves that. I know that you know sometimes when you get like a 42 page pre read, you're like, this is not a pre read, right? But like an executive summary or just something to really share with what we are going to be reviewing in this meeting, uh, what what I want to get out of this meeting, uh, what what I want everyone else to get out of this meeting, right? To make it sure that it's really organized and structured, um, so so you're making the best use of everyone's time. Um, and you know sometimes that can even generate conversation and input ahead of the meeting, right? So people come into it already having had some of these sidebars. Um, and that's also a way to make sure that my voice is being heard or to allow others for their voices to be heard, right? So some of that pre-engagement I think is really important. And then what I would also say um, is that I think so much of this is on, on us as, as, as leaders, whether everyone's a leader in your organization, whether you happen to have a team of 20 or whether you're an individual contributor, everyone is a leader. And you know what I do and what I've tried to pay really close attention to over the past 13 months is that when you see that uh, someone is constantly trying to say something in the meeting, right? And, you know, we're in Zoom right now, so my yellow box is, is highlighted. So you can very easily, whether you're on Teams or Zoom, whatever medium you're on, you can see if someone is constantly trying to raise their hand and get their get their voice heard. And it's not always easy. It's really not. And and we're in this virtual space and everything is different. And, and some people's level of technology is, is stronger than others. So, you know, I always try to make sure as well um, to, to say, okay, I'm sorry, I see Sylvia is trying to say something. Sylvia, would you like to speak up, right? So I think that's something that we can do to help one another and, and help um, help other females, help, help other males. It doesn't matter, right? Just to making sure that everyone's voice is being heard because it can be quite challenging uh, in this new virtual space that we're kind of all thrown into. Um, so I find just like really observing and watching and paying attention to make sure because we are better with everyone's opinion, right? We are better when we hear other people's input um, that makes us better decision makers and that makes us better business people. Um, so, so we should be asking and actively seeking that, that input while in this 100% virtual world. Yeah, love that. So Allison, how about for you in terms of um, speaking up in a remote world versus a, a in-person world? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Tara and Sylvia's points. I think the other tool that I use is I, the camera. Turning on the camera also tends to encourage others to turn theirs on. And I'm a big body language reader. And I think that's one of the constraints in a virtual world is, you know, if everyone has their camera turned off, you miss that eye contact, you miss that engagement. You don't know if someone is, you know, offloading the washing machine or if they're really paying attention to, to what it is that you're sharing. Um, so I, I like to model what the behavior that I want to see by, by being on camera, being present. It also helps me stay focused. Um, it's very easy to multitask when someone can't see your face. Not as easy when you're on camera. Um, and then the other, the other kind of two tactics that I use or I've seen use and have, have worked well with me is to Tara's point, if you're going into a meeting to make a decision and there is some sort of pre-read, pre-aligning with some of the key decision makers in a smaller group is also a really effective tactic to make sure everyone kind of has has the opportunity to ask questions, think through the, the conversation before you come into the broader group where maybe some aren't as comfortable or there's not as much time to work through some of those details. And then also while you're in the meeting, something that's been, it's done well um, when I've been in a meeting, so I like to now model this where I can, is, is having a rescuer in the room so someone that even if, if you make a point and it's not fully kind of heard or it doesn't stick, someone else in the room saying, hey, what Tara just said was actually really important. Let's revisit that conversation. And just having someone else reopen the mic for you has been really effective in making sure that the point gets across. So it's, it's something that's been done for me very well. And as a result, uh, I try to keep it in the back of my mind when I'm in a meeting kind of more on the, on the sidelines and it happens to someone else. Gotcha. So we, we have another question, which I'd love to hear from you about, Allison. So uh, it's a question about starting a new company and starting at a new company in lockdown. So not having the opportunity to meet a lot of people in person. So, um, so compounded by the fact you're not going to be meeting people face to face. Do you have any advice for, would you recommend for someone in that sort of situation? You know, you're in your first three months, you want to make a great impression and you, you know, you don't get to meet people. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge and not one that, that I've had to face yet, but I think about often because it's so hard to change careers and change companies and then to do it also 
in an environment where you can't meet your coworkers face to face. Um, props to you all that are going through that, first of all. Um, but it comes back again for me to to one on one relationship building. So that is probably one of the elements that I miss not being in an office is that informal conversation and connection, you know, you'd meet someone in the hallway or at the water cooler on the way to the restroom. And those are a lot of relationships that I don't get right now working virtually because maybe those are individuals that I don't directly work with. So we're not in a meeting every day. Um, but I take that active effort to set up time, especially when you're new. Maybe you take the first meeting, you observe, you see who's in the room, you find someone who said something that is interesting to you, or maybe they're your business partner set up one-on-one -on -one time on the calendar with them. And I encourage others to not just make it professional, but also a little personal because that's how you build the best connections that last long beyond kind of the Zoom or the conference room. Getting to know, you know, Tara, how are the children? Um, is that good element that you can bring forward to the next conversation? And it, it allows you to be remembered as well. So yes, a little extra effort in the virtual world, but at least at J&J, &J, our culture really welcomes it. Um, I actually love when people put one-on-ones on, -ones on my calendar because it gives me a break from the, the burn and churn of the work day and allows it to just be human. Um, and another thing that I think we do well here is active meetings or walking meetings. So, you know, a time actually when maybe I'm not in front of the camera or computer because I'm out walking the dog. And I know that the other person on the other end is doing the same or, you know, they're walking with their children. I think it, it humanizes it. And anytime we can do that in a virtual setting, I think it's, it's very important and effective. Now, and I know there's a lot of people who have adopted dogs during the pandemic. So I imagine you get a lot of takers <laughs> on one of them. <laughs> Tara, I saw you smiling. I imagine you have um, some thoughts about this, you know, starting, starting a new role, maybe not a new, a new company, but in, during a pandemic when you're fully remote really really hard um it's probably been my the hardest hardest part about starting this new role and it's funny i just you know i've been doing a series of like get to know me type meetings and town halls and things like that and to, to introduce myself to my new team and to my business partners and to my leadership team even really and you know i feel like the the number one resounding <laughs> feedback i give people is i am I'm incredibly people oriented, right? And I am a, a chatter. I am a chatty Kathy. I love to sit around and just ask you about your weekend and talk to you about your your animals and ask you how your parents are doing and you know what movies did you guys see this weekend? Have you seen the new Netflix show, right? Um, I am that is you know probably like a strength and a weakness at times because I could be a, a bit too chatty. Um, and, but it's how I get to know people. And, you know, I think, you know, nine out of 10 people would tell you that I'm, I'm incredibly authentic and easy to talk to. Right. So that is a strength of mine. And, uh, it's what I love to do, right. It's, it's why, it's why I want to work for J and J and why I want to lead and manage teams because I love working with people and I love creating relationships. And I feel like it has been, you know, my last role, everybody knew me, right. I had two years of time with them in the office before, before COVID started. So everybody knew me. So we were able to move into this new virtual world and it, and it kind of sucked, but we were able to, to get by because people knew me. Now in this new space, oh my gosh, um, it's, it's really, really hard. So I think it's what Allison said. It's finding the time, it's carving out time to meet with my team individually, to meet with, with as many people as possible, right? And to try to try as much as possible to, to build these new relationships. Um, it's also, you know, being, being myself, right. Being a hundred percent myself, right. I just popped up 10 minutes ago to turn on off the baby camera, um, <laughs> you know, cause he was screaming um, and that's my reality. That's my world and that, and, and that, and I have no problems admitting that to people. You know, a lot of the times Toby will join me in morning calls. He'll join me in an evening call. If my husband is around shuttling the other kids, I think allowing people to see a, a little bit more about myself and, um, you know, what's going on in my household, which is usually complete insanity, um, is helping to, to build some of these relationships that, um, that, are, that are hard to create while we're all on computers. Uh, it's not easy. So, but um, we have to, we just have to keep trying, right, and being ourselves and, and continuing to be kind to ourselves and to one another. Yeah. Sylvia, do you have any, any thoughts or any advice for someone who started a new job um, in, the, in the pandemic, started a fully remote job? 
you know, I, I just everything what the other lady said, it's tough, right? It is tough and acknowledging that it is tough, right? You know, you, you, it's difficult enough going into a new job, you know, being the first, the newbie, first day at school or first day going into the office. But when there is no office to get into, it is tough, right? So first off, be kind to yourself, right? Just be kind, right? Don't, don't expect it to be as good as when it's back in the office. Do everything that Alison and Tara said, right? Carve out the time, sending messages to folks on meetings, right? On Zoom calls, right? Like we're doing personal messages, hi, you know, and getting some rapport there. Use every opportunity you can to build relationships, right? Is what I would say. And just be thinking about it, knowing that J&J is a relationship-driven company, okay? So you have to focus on building relationships. So use any way you can, right? To, to try and get up that curve. But also be kind to yourself because there will become a day when we're back in the office and then you'll be able to take it up. Okay. Yeah, love that. So, um, and I have another question for you. It's another question from the audience. Um, someone saying they love the concept of quality over quantity when talking on Zoom. And, but, but they've also found they get negative comments about a lack of enough talking time in a critical individual's opinion. Do you have any, any thoughts or advice for someone who maybe doesn't speak up as much or has gotten feedback that they need to speak up more? For me? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. um, yeah, so I think, um, I mean, what, I, what I'm reading here, I think is I've had that regarding my lack of enough time, not bringing people with you, right? That's that's what I'm reading here. I don't know whether I'm mis mistaken that or not, but, but not bringing people with you, right? Again, right, you need to make sure you got everyone at the party, right? When you're making sure that you're making a decision. So, you know, spending the time to go, okay, what am I hearing? Are we aligned? Are we not aligned? Specifically calling people out, right? And saying, hey, John or Mary or whatever, what are you doing? Are you, you, are you aligned on it? And pausing to take the breath, right? To, to make sure people are aligned to bring them forward. OK, is super important. And, um, you know, I suffer from it myself. Right. I mean, it's like, OK, we've made a decision. Let's move. Right. And um, whereas and so it doesn't really matter if it's on Zoom or not. Right. And I've just learned over the years to take that breath and make sure you're aligned coming out of that meeting because it's going to come back to haunt you. Right. You're just going to have to go back and do it again. OK, so, so it's take important. a breath. Don't rush it. Make sure people are OK and get them to verbalize it. OK. Mm -hmm. So it's important as a leader to recognize that and really help the person who maybe has some things to say, but isn't as, you know, um, isn't as much of an extrovert as someone else. So um, Tara, how about for you, if someone, if you knew someone who was getting kind of negative comments that they weren't participating enough, they had kind of the opposite problem of not getting their voice heard uh, or a different, different uh, part of that problem. Yeah, so I think, I think that the, you know, if, if people are getting that feedback, but again, I think as leaders, we need to respect and understand that not everyone always feels comfortable in this new world of technology. And, you know, I, I think sometimes the one-to-one -one interactions is preferable and can sometimes be more beneficial. So, so maybe it's a combination of what Sylvia just mentioned of getting, you know, getting agreements and moving forward while in, in the virtual world. But then, you know, I think Allison mentioned it too, some pre-alignment ahead, ahead of time also, right? So if you're, if you're feeling like, you know, you're getting, you know, negative input that you're not contributing um, while on call, um, while on a call, but yet you're having a hard time even getting your voice heard, then, then I, I would, I would say it's that pre-alignment also. So if you are walking into a or if a meeting gets scheduled on your calendar and you see it and you know the content and you have a, a definite opinion or you've done the analysis ahead of time, um, you know, I, I, nothing can replace for me at least good pre-work, right? And putting at the work ahead of time. Um, so maybe you're not the most vocal person on the phone, but putting in that pre-work ahead of time um, could pay dividends at the end. Um, and so your voice is getting heard, but perhaps it's not in, you know, the Zoom or the Microsoft Teams platform. Um, because either can't be heard or, or, you know, it's not your, it's not your preference. And I think as leaders, again, I think, you know, um, diversity and inclusion means a lot of different things, right? And we need to respect and, and understand that this world is, is, um, may not be comfortable for everyone, right? So as leaders, we need to do our job and make sure we're doing our job to make everyone feel 
uh, inclusive and, and creating that inclusive environment and making everyone feel like their voice is welcome and heard, uh, whether it's over a Zoom or whether it's over a one-to-one -one personal chat before or afterwards. Yeah. Allison, do you have anything to add to that in terms of advice for someone who might find themselves in that situation? Um, yeah, I'm, as, as a project manager, I'm often the facilitator of the meeting and there's often kind of a variety of opinions in the room or functional areas. And I think sometimes you know, when the conversation reaches a stalemate or, you know, I don't have an opinion because it's not my role to have an opinion, it's my role to present the scenario. Sometimes I use rephrasing or, or repeating to help kind of just keep the conversation moving forward. So what I think I just heard was, you know, Bob wants us to focus on, on cost and Mary also wants us to consider quality. You know, how can we move, move forward in a way that balances both optimistically? Um, and asking a question or just repeating what I think I heard and then giving people an opportunity to correct it if it was wrong or chime in is, is another way to contribute without speaking just to speak. So do you have any thoughts around what sets Johnson & Johnson apart in terms of advancing women in the workplace, particularly into a leadership role? Um, you know, you've, you've touched, I think everyone's touched a little bit on the culture at J&J, &J, very supportive culture. So, so what, um, what sets it apart? Allison. Sure. Um, I think it's, it's twofold for me. One is a flexible culture and work style. So there are plenty of folks that don't work a traditional kind of eight to five or nine to five. They get their work done at different hours to accommodate either a personal appointment, caregiving, et cetera. And it's, it's very much a part of our culture and it's, we're very open and, and flexible in that. Um, even when we were in the office, it, it was commonplace, you know, to leave a couple of hours early, to take an appointment, and then some people maybe would log back on at night just to get their work done or whatever works for you. And on the other side for me is, is growth and development. There are a ton of opportunities, I think Tara mentioned some of them earlier, to continue growth, accelerate my career both internally and externally. So there's a lot of accelerated development programs that offer, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentorship, as well as the technical skill build. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits for me of working at a large corporation is just the magnitude of resources that are available. And then lastly, just a ton of opportunity, really endless opportunity. Um, we have the pleasure of working for, you know, a large company that really operates like many separate companies in medical device, consumer, vision, and pharmaceutical and there's, there's an endless runway, at least that I see, to continue growing and developing, but keep doing something different along the way. So those are all the reasons why I really love working at J&J &J and plan to continue my career here for now. So, Sylvia, how about for you? What do you think sets J&J &J apart from- um, uh, Well, I, I think and... Alison mentioned it. I mean, J&J, &J, it's not even a country, it's a continent, right? It's like a continent, right? I mean, we've got like so many regions, so many segments, and even within the segments, right? It is so different in the segment, right? Like our vision care business is super different from our DPS business, from our BWI business. So you can actually spend your entire career you know, moving through this continent, right? And learning and it's like starting starting um, a new job in a new company, right? And it's that exciting. So the diversity of the company, but also the always feeling that you're being supported. For, for me, for sure, there was always a sense of we support you, go and do that and um, help if needed, right? And there was this, I wanna say the safety net, right? That's there but the just general feeling of inclusivity and support for female leaders and developing female leaders in a very overt way, which I've always found and appreciated. Also too is some of my best, you know, mentors have been females and it's that mentoring and you know they're there to reach out to and the support from, from other female leaders has made it really understand what can be possible, okay? And creating the vision for that. Yeah. Okay. Tara, how about for you? What, what sets it apart for you, Johnson & Johnson? So my whole career has been with J&J, &J, and uh, I feel so lucky to have made that statement um, because I've had so many different career, careers within J&J &J that, you know, I've never been bored an entire day of my life. I've lived, uh, you know, in the U.S., I've lived overseas, I've lived in New Jersey, I've lived in Florida. So I feel so incredibly lucky to work at this company and with these people. And 
to be making these products that we that we that we sell and that we uh, that we develop. Um, it this is an incredible place to work. Um, from a as a as a female, right? And as I see the investment that J and J makes in women, has made in myself, right? And and in my family. And um, you know, there is work to be done, let's be honest, right? There's work to be done everywhere. Um, in every business, you know, private sector, public sector, government, every country of the world, there is work to be done. But J and J knows that and they recognize that and they're willing to do something about it. And that's what makes me so proud to work here as well. J and J fully recognizes that when all voices are at the table, female, male, uh, does not matter, right? When all voices are at the table, we are a better company. When when our when our decisions and the people who are running our company reflect our customer base, right? When we actually, the people who we, who we are are reflecting the actual people that, that we're, that we're creating these products for, that makes us a better, that makes us a better company. And that makes us a, a company where people want to come work for. That makes us a company that people want to partner with uh, suppliers, right? My field that makes a, a company that suppliers want to work with us and partner with us in creating these, um, you know, amazing uh, healthcare solutions. Um, so I think, you know, J&J recognizes that there is work to be done and they're willing to put their efforts, um, their dollars, their focus, their innovation, and they're willing to do something about it. And even doing it, doing stuff outside of our four walls, right? Investing in the community, investing in women outside of J&J, um, you know, makes me incredibly proud when when I, I work with and I hear the amazing things that we're doing both in and outside of J&J um, and, you know, just how they've supported me and my family over my almost 19 years. Um, it's, it's remarkable and it's incredible. And, um, you know, I could not be more more grateful to, to work here. But but rest assured, there is still still work to be done for sure. Right. So we have another question um, from the audience which is what if you're not the youngest person in the room, but the oldest? So how do you show value without being the old seasoned person that no one wants to hear from? How do you, how do you build, build those relationships and value? Is it different when you're from being the youngest person in the room? And I'll open that up to anybody who'd like to answer that. Yeah, Tara? I'll, I'll start. So I actually, actively seek and I don't want to say older because that, that has a negative connotation sometimes more seasoned more matured people on my team I find in J&J &J, for the most part you know people are moving so quickly and so rapidly that having those more seasoned team members is becoming less and less frequent so in some ways, um, you know, I think the reverse almost of that question that I'm usually actively seeking the individuals that have been on the team the longest, have the most seniority, have the most, um, you know, tenure in the space. And I'm actively asking for their opinion and their guidance uh, because I want to know what has happened before me and what has happened before the person before, before me even, right? Um, and so if you're, you know, I would, I would really encourage people to kind of almost flip, flip that a bit. Um, ourselves as leaders, as well as, as employees and contributors, because, you know, in a day and age where I think there's people are moving so rapidly and it's really encouraged this rapid movement, having those SMEs and having those, uh, those more tenured individuals is really an asset um, that we don't necessarily see as much anymore. So if you are that person, uh, know that, know that about yourself, know that about your brand and your recognition and own it, right? Own it and upsell it, right? Because me as a new person in my job, if you've been in your role for 10 plus years and you know the history and, and you know, that is, that is an asset. That's something valuable that I want to know and that I want to learn from. Um, so I know that, you know, sometimes it can be considered like, oh, I've just, I've been here and I've seen this and I've done that and no one values my opinion. I would really encourage you flip that a little bit, right? And, and see how valuable you are, um, while at the same time being, of course, being open to the new and being open to new suggestions and doing things differently. But ultimately, know your value. Uh, you're in your job, whether it's J&J &J or not, know your value. You're there for a reason, and, and we want to hear from you. Yeah, love that. Sylvia, do you have any Anything to add to that? I, mean, I, I just think this question surprises me because I don't think it's about speaking up, right? Or be, I think it's about, you know, I think Tara alluded it, you know, it's not about your age, right? It's about the contribution that you bring and valuing your own contribution. If you've got a good 
if you feel and you're bringing valued con contribution back to the conversation, what is your input into the conversation? Is it valued? Is it adding value, right? And um, sometimes we can get caught in prisons in our own minds, right? Um, and you should see beyond that. It's about the value that you bring. And every day you come to work, if you're bringing value um, and it's very clear, then you've nothing to worry about, okay? Great, Allison, uh, anything, any other thoughts on this? No, I just agree. I think I think we need all perspectives in the room. That's how we make the best decision um, going forward and make the best choices for our business. And I find the more seasoned or tenured folks in the room tend to be able to identify the risks the best. And because they've been through them or they know how the system works. Um, I I also lean into to those individuals on a team because especially when we're in an innovative space and we're trying to build something that's never been done before like launch a vaccine in nine months, it is incredibly critical to have those experts that know how it's done and how it works so that they can build the creative solution to how we can get there faster and uh, reliably. So I agree, we welcome all of those opinions. Not only do we welcome them, we need them. So stay there, speak up. Um, another element that we have in J&J &J is a reverse mentorship program which is where the more seasoned kind of leaders can also learn new perspectives and, and opinions of the more emerging talent. And I think that's a really unique and beneficial way to keep that knowledge sharing going in both directions. Um, so maybe I would encourage that if there's an individual who feels, you know, they've, they've been stuck in their ways and they've, they've seen it all is to seek out some of those new and diverse opinions, because I, I believe you can always learn um, regardless of age, tenure years, degrees, anything. Um, there's always something to learn. So stay curious and, and keep asking as well. Great, so we only have just a couple minutes left. So I'd love to get um, your just sort of quick advice on um, helping someone reach their full potential, no matter kind of where they are in their career. And, and you know, do you have any, any kind of parting advice for people on that? To who? To me? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's all of, for me, your career is all about self management, right? Managing yourself, right? Managing yourself, right? And that means learning to trust yourself, trust your, trust your heart, your moral compass, on, you know, trust your heart, trust, trust your mind, trust your intuition. So really, really learning to trust yourself, right? And understand what you can do. That's really all you need to do, right? Because if you're expecting somebody else to do it for you, then that's not going to happen. But really understanding and knowing yourself and where you can you can be. You can be whatever you want to be, right? And it's just trusting yourself that you can do that. And if we if you just learn to trust yourself, because it takes a lifetime, right? Just learning to trust yourself and what you can bring and knowing your contribution and valuing your contribution. You know, you're just unleashing your potential. Okay, so I hope that helps. Definitely. A Allison, how about for you? Some, some quick advice on reaching your potential. I would piggyback on Sylvia's comment and say, be yourself as well. So be vulnerable, demonstrate and model. You never know who else is in the room watching um, that might take your example and unlock their own full potential. So don't be afraid to be you. You're the only one that can um, and, and help us you kind of see the opportunity and, and especially if you feel like you're swimming upstream more of the reason to dig in um, because you never know who's behind you yeah tara we'll, we'll give you the, the last word on that and reaching your potential yeah yeah so actually i used to work in sylvia's org sylvia was uh my boss's boss quite a few quite a few years ago and she actually gave me that advice um so it's it's just wonderful to hear um, and know that the advice that Sylvia has given me through my career has been so powerful and, and impactful, right? To, to, to know yourself, to know it's in, I think you kind of put it in like something Sylvia, this is years ago, but like in the pit of my stomach, right? Like my fire within knowing my, knowing my power. That's what she told me, know my power and know myself. And uh, you gave me that advice, golly, probably like my goodness, 
four, four years ago, and it still sticks with me. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that, that, that touches so many of the different things that we spoke about. And uh, maybe to end on a fun note also, right, to, to fulfill our goals and our dreams and our wishes and our aspirations, for me, so much of it has been to have fun, right? I am a firm believer of fun. I love J&J because I get to have fun. I get to work with these amazing women, uh, women, men from all different parts of the world. And, you know, what's that phrase? Like, if you if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day of your life. And that, to me, just resonates. I want to enjoy what I'm doing, especially after having been home uh, on our computers, right, for the past 13 months with all of our kids around us and our parents and our animals and our spouses and our partners, right? If you don't have fun doing what you're doing, you're going to make yourself crazy. Um, so, you know, set goals for yourself, set ambitious, big, lofty goals. And if you're not having fun doing it, then then figure something else out, right? Because life is too short to, to really not enjoy this space. We spend so much time working. So enjoy what you do. It's so important. Yeah, love that. Well, thank you um, very much, ladies. Um, really appreciate your time. I, I think there was some really great advice, not only on being heard, but just on, on advocating for yourself. And um, thank you again. I, I appreciate it. And I think the audience does as well. And for those of you who are interested in exploring a career with Johnson & Johnson, I have dropped the link to our jobs in the chat. So take a look. There's quite a few open roles. Um, and everyone have a very good rest of your Monday. So take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.